so intrigued A song so inviting You start to advance With locked in a gaze and can't look away 1875 podcast, we've got a very special edition today as we've got Rovers goalkeeper and current first goalkeeping coach of Notts County, Jake Keen on. Um, thanks for coming on, Jake. Um, obviously, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, how are you? All right. I think I think everybody's in the same situation, aren't they? A little bit lost on what day we are and what time it is with being in lockdown. It certainly is. It's very strange, isn't it? Um, something that's unprecedented, but this will hopefully waste um, an hour of your time. Um <laughs> And you can um, talk some football um, and some Blackburn Rovers, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so tell us a, bit, a little bit about yourself. So, what have you been doing then since leaving Rovers? You've had a f- couple of clubs, haven't you? Um, and you're into coaching now, I believe. So, how's that going? Yeah, it's going really well. Um, sort of fell into it at the start of the season. Um, and it's it's worked out worked out well for myself personally. And, and, and for Notts County, we're doing, doing well in the league and... Hopefully, when it all restarts, we can we can get get back to the football league. But obviously, there's there's bigger things at the moment that that take precedence, and football's all sort of on a back seat. Certainly does. Is there any inside information you have with regards to the season, or is it just do you know as much as us? Is it a case of it starts when it starts? I think it's just a case of when it st- it starts when it starts. Um, obviously, the big boys will all make a decision, um, and then I think everybody else will sort of follow suit after the Prem have decided what they're going to do. Yeah, it's a bit frustrating, really, isn't it? That it seems to be that it's Premier League, Premier League, Premier League, and then as you work your way down the football league pyramid, there's just not as much um, attention given, especially given that it's the bringing fans in and whatnot is the it's the butter for these clubs, isn't it? Type it's it's what keeps them going. So yeah. a bit more um, attention would have been nice, but we're here, um, and there's not much to do really, is there? We can just yeah, get exactly. on and yeah. So. You obviously started your career at Derby, didn't you, coming through their academy. How did that move to Blackburn materialise? Because obviously they're not necessarily close clubs. Talk me through that. Was it Blackburn that were interested or did it just sort of happen? No, so um, obviously, like you said, I I did my YTS at Derby. Um, I was there from 10. um, And Paul Jewell was the first team manager at the time. Um, And Gary Walsh was his goalkeeping coach. Um, So I'd been... I'd actually applied to do an American scholarship, um, been accepted to, to go out there to go to university and, and to play football over in the States. And um, I got a phone call from the Academy Education and Welfare Officer saying to obviously turn it down. Um, uh, I was going to get offered a, a two year deal. Um, so from from that phone call to me turning it down, um, Paul Jewell got sacked and his his first team staff left. Nigel Clough came in and I think the focus was was just purely on the first team. Um, so out of my under 18s team, I think two lads got offered six month deals. Um, the rest the rest were were released and and sort of left to do their own thing. Um, so obviously in in the meeting, I was told that. The offer had been rescinded, um, but Portsmouth had put in an offer in the December and the club had turned it down. Um, and then Walshy had gone, had left Derby and he'd, he'd gone to Blackburn to do um, to do a bit of scouting. Obviously, rang him as, as soon as I'd been told that I was being released. And I think he, he got on the phone to, to Bobby Mims and got me straight in at Blackburn. Um, and I was there for a week and, and got offered a deal. So it was all pretty fast then, really, it seems, from obviously the Rovers first coming in and then um, everything happening. So was that just a trial period, technically, that week, and then it just sort of fell into place after that? Yeah, so um, obviously Portsmouth had been made aware that I'd been released, so they invited me down to to go and train with them and to, to have a look. Um, and Blackburn, similar. Um, but I'd obviously I'd, I'd to tell Blackburn that I'd already agreed to go down to Portsmouth Went down there, um, trained with their first team and, and the manager and, and Colsey at the time, he was a first team goalkeeping coach. Um, they offered me a deal and I just said, look, I've, I've said to Blackburn, I'll, I'll go up and do the same and I'll, I'll give you an answer as soon as I've done the week at Blackburn. Um, 
then obviously Sam Allardyce was a manager at the time. Blackburn were flying. Um, there's some massive names like the training grounds, unbelievable, um, and it just it just fit better at the time for me personally. So that's I chose Blackburn in the end. Was that always a, a no-brainer? Because obviously Portsmouth at the time must have been going through some serious difficulties financially. Um, was that always a no-brainer that, that Rovers were the club um, and something that you never regretted? Because um, obviously in a few years we didn't exactly do brilliantly. Um, or were you happy with the, with the decision that you'd made? No, I've, I've never regretted signing for Blackburn. Um, in terms of my footballing life, it's the best decision I ever made. Um, and probably having the offer rescinded from Derby is probably one of the best things that happened because it forced me to move away from home and, and grow up and, and sort of become a little fish in a big pond rather than staying where I was, family and friends supporting Derby and sort of getting ahead of my station. So Blackburn, it was always the right choice. It just felt right at the time. Yeah, definitely. And like you say, something, everything happens for a reason, doesn't it? The the offer didn't come through for Derby, but it, it opened up the opportunity to come to what well, at the time was a Premier League club. Um, yeah. With some massive names as well, the likes of Paul Robinson, um, who I'm sure we'll move on to soon. Um, and just talk about, obviously, your time with him and, and how he helped you develop, or if he did at all. Um, never know, do you? Um, but, yeah. Um, so you came Rovers. Obviously, I had a few loan spells. Hartlepool, Rochdale, Yeovil, Oldham. Um, how beneficial do you think law moves are for younger players? Did you find that it helped you a lot? Because if you look at goalkeepers, you got yourself. David Rea was the same. Obviously, he went out to Southport, I think it was, and... It, you both came back better keepers. Is that something that you think is beneficial yeah, um, it, for all players? Yeah, it's massively beneficial for all players, but I think goalkeepers more so um, because you're playing men's football. There's just there's something different playing blokes football um, compared with under-18s, reserve teams, in-house games. It's, it's just... There's... <sighs> There's always pressure on you when you're a goalkeeper, but when you when you when you go out on loan and you're playing with lads whose whose careers and houses and and lives depend on winning games, it becomes it, it's just, you you can't replicate that. And I think then once you've played competitive men's football, that's all you want to do. And with Hartlepool, it, look, I I love that club and. I think if I could have stayed the following season, I would have done. But again, that was that was Gary Walsh. He'd he'd been offered the the first team goalkeeping role there, and there was an injury, and I'd only gone to to be in and around it. Um, I was there for a week, and Scott Flinders ended up rupturing his thumb ligaments, and at 19, I was I was thrown straight into it. Because I think if you look at if you look at goalkeepers, they don't start playing till early 20s, mid 20s um, and to go at 18, 19 and, and play 25 games and, and do do well. Um, I think I kept 10 clean sheets in 25 games or something. Um, was massive. Like it gave me the impetus to, to go, right, I can, I can actually do this and, and play at a competitive level and I really enjoyed it. I think that's a big thing for goalkeepers as well, isn't it? Because I imagine that as a keeper, I think a lot of things, and obviously you can tell me if I'm wrong, but a huge thing would be confidence. Obviously, if you make a couple of mistakes as a goalkeeper, it seems to be highlighted 10 times more if, say, a midfielder misplaces a pass. Um, Because if you make a mistake, there's likely to be a goal. Um, So would you say confidence is a huge part of that and and going to places like Hartlepool and, like you say, keeping 10 clean sheets played a big part in that development as well of thinking, like you say, yeah, I am, I am ready for this. Yeah. Confidence is massive because Monday to Friday, you get battered shooting competitions, small sided games, like you, you concede in goals and training and it affects you. And then to go out and play and keep clean sheets and make important saves. Confidence is, is the biggest thing for a goalkeeper. And that comes that comes from your own performance. It comes from your coaches, fans, even more so now than when when I first started. Social media, like confidence, is massive for a keeper. And but I think like the one, like you're saying, it does. If a goalkeeper make makes a mistake, it, it leads to a goal. 
nine times out of ten. Um, and I think obviously no one no one sets out to to make a mistake or to concede a goal, but I think those experiences definitely help. And yeah, it's just it, confidence is massive. It's a massive it's- thing. Yeah, it's interesting you put it like that with the training thing, because I don't think we ever think of it like that. Obviously, when you're training, you're in net. It's not like a Sunday league where the keeper might play up front for um, 30 minutes of training. It's like, yeah, you'll be in net, people are pelting balls at you, and their job is to score goals, isn't it, obviously? So your job is to try and save them, but you take so many one-on-ones, you're going to concede a fair chunk. Um, so it's, in, it's interesting you say that, that how how that obviously does have a bit of an impact when you're in training and you're, you're conceding these goals. Um, but yeah, so obviously had your loan moves, moves, sorry. Um, you obviously, you spent time at Rovers as well and you're working with someone like Paul Robinson, obviously a huge stature in the English game. Um, he's been to World Cups. Um, he was England's number one for a, a considerable period of time. Did you find him key to your development or was it something that the coaches took more of a, um, a seat with that, more of a role, and, and they were the ones that really helped mould you into the goalkeeper that you'd become. I think more so the coaches. Um, look, Robbo is he's a massive character. Um, it was brilliant to train with him and Mark Bunn and Frank Fielding, and Jason Brown was there when I first when I first joined. And you, you do pick little bits up from all of them. Um, and look, the, the clubs that I've been at. I've been lucky enough to have some unbelievable goalkeepers within within the group, like John Ruddy, Kieran Westwood, obviously Robbo, Bunny, like Declan Rudd that's at Preston, like Joe Wilds, like everyone's got their own style. Um and I think you, you obviously try and take little bits from from everybody, but it's it's more down to the to the coaches. Um and obviously the the best the best coaches that I've ever worked with, Bobby Mims was unbelievable in my development. Gary Walsh um, and Dean Kiley, and I've always said if I if I was ever lucky enough to be at a club where I could bring in my own goalkeeping coach, those three would be top of the list. It's interesting that that these people have had such a, a huge impact on your career, and that this is someone that you'd think, well, I'd want to bring them in to help me out with players for example it's mad how much an impact people can have on your own career that these are people that you want to then help you out at a later date with your own coaching um yeah. it's nice as well yeah no i think with goalkeeping you you spend so much time in an isolated group um before you before you join in the main session with with the outfield lads that it's hard not to form these tight bonds um like I still speak to Walsh I still speak to Mimsy speak to Dean Kiley every now and again like because they have played such a a lot a, they've been a key factor in my in my life um you almost spend more time with them than you do with your actual family um mm. so it's hard not for them to to have an impact have you found that you've took elements of their coaching with your own um obviously Whilst you're now you're at Notts County, is that something that you've looked at and think, well, that worked well when they were t- coaching me, so I'm going to use this for Notts County's goalkeepers? Yeah, I think it's more, it's the goalkeepers, it's not, you can't just put on a generic session and it yeah. works for everyone. It's more the way in which they put on the sessions and the, like the, the way they delivered them and, and the way they were during the session and, like during match days and then away from away from the club um it's more about how they were as people rather than what they what the sessions they put on like don't get me wrong I'll still put on sessions that I really enjoyed and if if I get feedback from the keepers where they said oh, I don't really get why we're doing this or I've not enjoyed this then I'll open it up to them and say right well what do you think we should be doing or what do you want to work on specifically just like Mimsy Walshy and, and Dino did did for us. Mm, definitely, and I think that open conversation I say with that isolated group is obviously important because if you're stuck on each other's nerves, then there's obviously issues. Um, moving on though, so 
obviously you made your Premier League debut, didn't you, against Chelsea, last game of the season, mm. were already relegated. Even though that was the case, obviously it wasn't necessarily a great time for the club. Um, and we'll talk a bit about that later on. How much of an honour was that? So you were only young at that time, obviously 2011, was it? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. something like that. Um, Goes had, 21 at the time. 21, so younger than what I am now. So I'm 22, and that's mad to think that at 21 you were you were playing in the Premier League. Um, and against Chelsea of all teams as well, a team that obviously one of the, the best in the country. Um, what was that like, the honour that you felt, obviously, playing? It was, it was bittersweet. Um, obviously every every young lad that starts out wants to play in the Prem and and to get that opportunity and to be deemed good enough to do it was was a massive honour and I think obviously I'd, I'd been at the club a number of years and, and to play for, Bla- for, for Blackburn in the Prem was it was an unbelievable honour but Again, it was it was tainted by the fact that that we were already relegated, and I think if you look at that team, we shouldn't have been in that situation. And I think if someone had have asked me, would you play if you had your time over? Could you play in the Prem for Blackburn when they were already relegated, or not play in that game and and the club were safe and had another season in the Prem? I think I'd say I'd rather not play. And make sure the club had another season in the prem. That's really interesting, that because obviously that's ob- obviously you've got to be selfless, don't you? But it's interesting to hear that that way of speaking. That obviously that's your your one appearance in the Premier League, and and you'd happily forgo that for the better of the club. I think that's the sort of thing that's good to see as well, because I think it shows that even at that time when we were really struggling with uh, there was obviously protests and everything that mm. there was still a togetherness within the players um, or at least with some of them um, and that the, there was a care for the club um, yeah. I don't I don't think the players ever stopped caring about the club and I can only speak for myself personally I I essentially grew up in Blackburn I left Derby and I lived in Blackburn I was there every day training like the club meant everything to me. It gave me that almost second chance after after being released at Derby. Um, like I, I had friends in the area. Like I grew up. Like I said, I grew up there. It was. It it became my club. Um, like everyone always says, like who do, who do you support? Who did you support as a kid growing up? And for me, Blackburn played the biggest part in my life. So. Regardless of what team I'm at, what I'm doing, it's always the first result I look for. Yeah, yeah I think that's nice to hear as well because, from our perspective, I think that we have got a good track record with academy prospects, um, and I think hearing that we've had such a positive impact on other players as a fan, anyway, I think that that feels nice that these mm. are people that um, look out for the club. Um, out of interest, who did you support when you were growing up? As obviously as a kid, like seven, eight years old, was it typical Manchester United or did you support Derby? And... I think I think it would have been Derby just because obviously I grew like I grew up in the area and I, I was playing for them at the time and family supported him. Um, always took an interest in Sheffield Wednesday because my granddad supported them and, and obviously I'd, I think it was his, his great uncle, so my great great uncle used to play for him, so I always, always took an interest in the two but for me personally I'd rather be playing than watching. Um, yeah. So it's there's no there's no one one team that's ever taken a precedence, and I've been like a mad fan. Like I said, I'd rather I'd rather be playing than watching. Yeah. So. I do find that interesting because from my perspective, if I was good enough, I'm nowhere near am. But if I was ever good enough to be a, a, a professional footballer, I always think that, oh, yeah, I'd only support Blackburn, blah, blah, blah. But I suppose the lines get blurred, don't they, as a professional footballer, because you're spending time playing for a club and you're getting to know that club. And, and yeah, it's interesting when you put it like that, because obviously there's the there's people like David Dunn, who stayed at, well, obviously went to Birmingham, but with the majority of his career was at Blackburn. But then there's also those that do move around a lot, and there's that sense of, well, you can't support a club because you're obviously moving to and from. So and you got to give your I all, don't you? 
yeah, I think you, and I think any player that says they don't do this is is lying a little bit to maybe protect themselves. But you become invested in the club that you play for because you're living in the area, you're chatting to the fans, like you, you can't not support the club that you're playing for because you do become invested in it. I think that's good to hear though, again from that fan's perspective, that players do care even if they sit there and, and some of them may look at it as just a job. But when you've got players like yourself who who do get invested in that, because to fans, a lot of the time, football's everything, it's their entire weekend. So to hear yeah. that, that things impact players some often as much as it does fans is obviously... It's the good feeling. I can't really describe it to be honest. It's weird. Um, it's just. Yeah, nice. I think. I think. I think players that come across that as if they don't care. Um, they do it to protect themselves a little bit. Okay. Um, I think a lot of footballers walk around with with a bit of not a coat of armour, but they try and protect themselves a little bit as because. Then your life almost becomes not your own, um, depending on what club you play for. Because like Blackburn, there was always four pages on the back of the the paper, and I think you've got to protect yourself a little bit and and show. I don't. It's a weird one. You you you're invested when you when you play for the team, but you've got to protect yourself a little bit. Because you know that at the drop of a hat, things can change. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, football, it's becoming more and more the case, isn't it, where transfers are happening all the time and, and you never know when a club's going to decide that they don't want you anymore. Um, so it's almost that sense of just, you know, obviously caring, but not letting yourself, or not showing that you care too much because then it becomes more of a story, I guess, doesn't it? Yeah, I think you become more of a target if you if you open up and show that you care much because then like you said if a transfer does happen it's like well last week he said he loved the club and this week is he's moving on yeah or he's done this he's done that so you've got you've got to walk a, a fine line but but for me like, like I said I, I love my time at Blackburn and I wouldn't change it for the world 100% and obviously you did eventually become the number one um Paul Robinson obviously got his injury um and then you were the number one for the remainder of our first season back and then for the first half of our second season. Um, how much of an honour was that? So obviously you spoke of, of the, the Premier League being bittersweet, but then becoming the first choice goalkeeper um, after, like you said, spending a, a considerable amount of time at the club and, and like I said, growing up in Blackburn almost. Um, was that something you took great pride in, becoming the first choice, uh, first choice goalkeeper? Yeah, massively. Um, it was, it was, an, a, it was sort of all the hard work that I put in over the years, doing the loan spells, training, being on the bench, sitting in the stands, like to to get that chance and and to to make it my own as such was it was a massive honour. Um, and like it was, Robbo had, had dipped a bit in form and obviously he was he was carrying an injury and and I got in. Um, it was a weird one actually. We were playing Blackpool away, and Henning Berg was the manager at the time. I remember the game actually, yeah. I yeah, don't... so I'd uh, we'd we were in the the Preston Marriott for a pre-match meal and before the team meeting, um, the the gaffer poked his head into the room and and giving me the curly finger and I thought, oh god. So we were struggling at the time. I thought he's going to say I'm I'm not going with a goalkeeper on the bench. Mm. And um, so I was fully prepared for to to sit in the stands and and to not be used. And uh, he sat me down and and just said, "How are you feeling?" I said, "Fine. Why?" And he just said, "You're going to play." <laughs> I was like, "Right, okay." I said, "Does does Robbo know?" And um, he said, "No, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring him in now." I was like, oh, "Fucking hell, like I'm gonna just keep my head down and and avoid." speaking to anybody because the first thing that the lads do as soon as the gaffer calls you in it's like what's he said what's going on yeah so from going in one door to sit with the gaffer I walked out the other one waited for him to speak with Robbo and then 
snuck into the back of the the team meeting and obviously me and Robbo knew and you put the team up on on the board and and that was it that was that was me playing and um like Robbo was was fine um there was no animosity towards me um like he was brilliant um the weird thing was we got to got to the ground and um the kit was out and you do your you do your little things before before you get ready to go out for a warm up and I remember saying to the kit man, "Where's my gloves?" And his face dropped. <laughs> he'd um, he'd managed to to not pack my gloves. Um, so weirdly, I ended up wearing Robbo's gloves for for my first game. <laughs> That's a little interesting story. I like that. I can't yeah, believe you forgot the gloves as well on the, on the first your first um, time as number one. Yeah. Um, yeah. How did Robinson take it with um, Henningberg then? Was that something he was okay with? Was it he was fine with you, but was angry at, at the manager, or was he just generally okay with with everything that that had happened? I think I think you'd have to ha- ask him because only he really knows. But look, no no player ever wants to to get dropped. Um, but I think it's different with goalkeepers because you do go out and warm up just the two of you and the goalkeeping coach and you do work in that small knitted group that you can't really harbour any animosity towards the the person that's playing ahead of you because ultimately it's it's down to you. Yeah. Um there's there's reasons that are in your control as to why as to why you're not playing. Um so I don't know his feelings towards towards the gaffer after that, but with me, he was he was always all right. The first season in the championship was a bit of a struggle, wasn't it? Though, so obviously, we think we went through what if you include caretaker managers, there was like four or five managers. So we started off with um, Steve Keane, and then obviously moved on to I think Eric Black was there, wasn't he? Henningberg, Appleton. Boyer. Yeah. Just I think at one list. point we had, had more managers than we had away wins. Yeah, so th- that must have been tough, and there was a pre-season expectation, wasn't there? I mean, I think at the time there was still Rovers fans felt that they should never have been in the Championship anyway, and that the only reason we were was because of a manager, which, like I said, we'll probably speak about a little later to get your yeah. views on him. Um, but. Was the expectation from the fans, did that add to everything that was going on? Because it was almost like, well, we should be beating Huddersfield. We should be beating um, Leicester at the time. Obviously, now that's not the case. But at that time, it was a case of like, these are teams that we should have been. Yeah, I think I think with the, the lads that had been there uh, the season and the seasons before, there was an expectation within that group that, we should be winning these games and, and we'll go straight back up. Um, but I think there was also the new lads that, that came um, didn't really understand the expectations of the club. Um, so I think it was it was a difficult one because I think even if you look at the squad that we had, we should have gone, we should have done better and, and gone back up. But at the same time, that you can't go through five managers in one season and then expect any sort of continuity or um, consistency when every new manager comes in, plays different players, plays a different system. Like just as you get used to one manager, the next one comes in. Um, mm. So it was it was a weird one, and I think it could have been handled better um, in every aspect. Um, from the lads all the way up in, to the owners, um, I think we just needed consistency, and we didn't and we didn't get it. Yeah, I think that Michael Appleton was only there for about sixty days or something like that, wasn't he? Fifty nine days, something ridiculous. And Berg was obviously had ten games and won one of them. Mm. Um, obviously, thanks with the con- conti- continuity. Um, <laughs> That's obviously something that that lacked uh, massively. Um, when you speak of the new lads that come in, how did people like Danny Murphy, Dixon the two who those type of players, how did they take to the, if there is a Blackburn way, but how did they take to that expectation? Because I think Danny Murphy especially is someone that's 
received a lot of not abuse, but there's a lot of hatred towards him from Rovers fans just because I think they see him as someone and we see him as someone that came for one last big payday on on big money. Um, and we thought he was going to rip up the championship and he just didn't. He just wasn't very good. Is that something that you, when you say about the expectation, is that the sort of player that, that came in and didn't quite understand? Or from your perspective, was it just not right for Danny Murphy? Um, I think it's a difficult one. He, we had a lot of experienced lads. When you look at Dixon and, and Murph, like they played in the Prem. And I think... Part of it was their expectation that the championship would have been easier than the Prem. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't think for one second that's that's true. Um, so I just, for all their experience, and I expect more, more so Murph, um, I just don't think he could cope with it. Um, we'd, put, we'd play teams and, like, Murph, he was a good, he, he was a great player. And when he was with us, he was, he was still a good player. But, teams that we played against had, had stick someone on him mm. and he couldn't get on the ball and obviously he was he was at an age where he couldn't do the running that he, he once did so he was kind of phased out of the game more so by by the opposition than than himself I just think if he'd if he'd have come a couple of years earlier then I think it would have been different but I think at the time the owners were were offering out stupid money to people, um, mm. and that obviously that that enticed people to come and and to like say pick up that that last payday, and it ultimately wasn't the right mm. thing for for the good of the team, and it it sort of created a little bit of a divide within the squad, and mm. I think when when Appy came in, he recognised that. Is that the divide? I spoke to Tommy Spur recently for another podcast, and obviously he came in the season afterwards. He said that there was there was a general awareness of those that were on on the big big money, but he said that it was something that they all pulled together at that point. The season prior was that something that was more more prevalent? Was it a case of these these lads are on big money and we're not type thing? Because obviously. The likes of Danny Murphy coming in, and, and you've got players that have previously been there, Scott, Dan, Mottingham's Pedersen. These players are going to be on big cash, and then you've probably got people that are on less. Was that something that caused issues within the the squad, and it was a case of not necessarily everyone pulling together the way they should have been? I, I wouldn't have said so. Um, it, it happens at, at every club. There's always going to be lads on more money than than others. Um, and I don't, I don't think that first season that caused an issue at all. I think it was, I think that first season was was maybe more of an ego thing that a lot of the lads had been Premier League players all their life and and maybe felt that they shouldn't be in the Championship. Um, and maybe we're we were walking into games thinking, like you said, we should be beating Leicester and Peterborough and whoever else was in the league at the time, and and we just weren't. It wasn't. It wasn't a given, and I think that was that was a hard thing for a, a few of the lads to to wrap their head around because I don't think they were used to the intensity of of the championship playing Saturday Tuesday like Saturday Tuesday a cup game on a random Wednesday like there was just game after game after game where the season before when we were in the prem you could play on a Saturday and, and not play till the following Sunday. Mm, so just that that complete different beast, isn't it? Just the case of there's a lot, there's more games to play. So there's a higher volume of games, and obviously you started in the cup competitions sooner, like the, the league cup or whatever it, whatever yeah. it's called at the moment. So obviously you you play an extra game earlier on, and yeah, it's it's interesting when you when you put it like that. Just that different, the different beast of the championship compared to to the Premier League. Um, the following season. Obviously, things did start to get a little bit better. Um, we finally had a manager in that people seemed to respect us from the fans' perspective anyway, with, with Boyer. Um, 
should that team have done more? I spoke, like I said, I spoke to Tommy Spur for one of these, and he said that that team should have done better. But he said that one of the big things was because there were so many new faces at the start of the season, it took them maybe three or four months to really get used to playing together and at playing as a team. Is that something you'd go along with? And should that team, with the likes of Tom Kearney in it, should that team have gone on to, to at least reach the playoffs? Yeah. The 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 only answer is yeah. Like we, we should have done better. Um but I think like you said, factoring in all the new faces, there was still players in and around the squad that that didn't want to be there and that, that the staff didn't want there. Um it was it was a weird place to be. Um like for me I go back to the season before I don't think we should have ever got rid of Appy. Um, okay, that's interesting. I think if we did, like, cause obviously we had, you had um, big Darren Moore in as part of his staff and and John Keeley as goalkeeping coach. I think if he'd have been given more time, we would have done better. Um, it is, yeah, it is interesting. That Appleton was a funny one, wasn't it? Because I don't necessarily think he was, we were drawing a lot of games. But we weren't particularly losing many, from what I can remember. It was just a lot of, a lot of draws. Um, I don't think we were having any danger of going down either. Um, no. No matter and what. I think, I think if he'd have been given till the end of the season, and so he could put his stamp on on the club, um, and then given a pre-season and and given a chance, because he he was he was ruthless. If if you didn't fit into what he wanted to do. Then you weren't part of the part of the squad. You didn't train with us. You were you didn't get changed with us. You didn't want the negativity around the place. Um, so I think he he walked in at a difficult time, and I think he was he was unfairly treated by the powers that be. Mm. And I think if he'd have been given given more of a chance, we would have done better. You can see he's, he's had he had fantastic success at Oxford, didn't he? And obviously he's been linked with massive jobs, like the Leicester job for a time. Um, so when you look at it like that, it's, it is one of them where you think, could he have done done better given given the better circumstances? Because for him at that point in his career, obviously he'd been at Portsmouth, who, was, who were in League Two, he'd been to Blackpool. Blackburn was a huge job for him and, and one that he couldn't really turn down, I guess, at the time. Um, no. So to not be given a, a fair crack at the whip, because I suppose it wasn't like Henningberg who was losing week in, week out, losing 4-1 to Peterborough and stuff like that. Mm. I think we lost. Um, so, yeah, it's it's certainly interesting um, when it's when it's put like that, 100%. Um, so it's midway through that season in that championship that then you lost your place. So first to Simon Eastwood and then uh, Robinson comes back in. So we spoke before about how Robinson took it. How was the news fed to you that Eastwood would be taking over as number one in a, in December, just before Robbo's return? Um, is that something you took well, or were you frustrated at that? Were you annoyed? Um, um, I, I was I was obviously I was obviously frustrated. Um, I think for me it'd been the first time that that I'd had a real dip in form. Um, because obviously the, the first season I'd done well and then I tore my cartilage, so so missed a few games and started the season. Um, and I think I was 22 at the time, so still young in terms of of being a, a number one in the championship. And I'd, obviously, I like I said before, no one no one goes out to make mistakes, but with uh, John Keeley had had come in and was the goalkeeping coach and he he bought Easty in. Um, and I think as a goalkeeping coach, you always you always want to bring someone in that either you've worked with or or that you know because it it makes the relationship easier. And and Easty Easty had come in and he's a great lad. I still speak to him once a week now. Um, like we got on really well, so there was no animosity between me and him. And at the time, I did deserve to come out of the team. I think I just needed a break. Um, I think I was, like I said, 22. I'd played 
38 league games or, or something like that. And I think maybe it's me looking back with rose-tinted glasses, but for the majority of them, I'd, I'd done well. Um, but in the lead-up to me losing losing my place, I think we played um, Brighton away and we were 2-1 down. And I think it was Craig Conway had a, had a shot um, and I parried it and he tapped in the rebound for us to lose 3-1. Um, and then we played Ipswich away and again 2-1 down I think 10 minutes to go and a ball had been played over the top and I came tear arsing out to try and clear it and their striker nicked it around me and, and tapped it in and that was that was us losing 3-1 again um, and I think the game before it affected my decision making in the Ipswich game and as a player, you're never going to turn around and say you need to come out because it's you just don't do it. But when when the gaffer when Gaz told me at the time, there was almost a sense of relief. Yeah. Um, because like I said, I was I was a young lad playing first team football, and and I needed to come out of it because I'd never I'd never made mistakes before, which had led to goals, and I think the intensity of, of training and, and playing Saturday, Tuesday and it being one after the other, you, it's, it comes down to confidence. My my confidence was rocked a little bit and I needed the break. And, and Eastie had gone in and, and done well. Um, and like me and, me and Gaz had had a chat um, and I said, look, like I feel like I'm I'm ready to go back in. I'm training well. I'm like my confidence is back. I, I want to be playing. And um, it was just as Robbo was coming, getting back to full fitness. And I think Eastie had had a bit of a bit of a wobble up in in one of the games. I think it might have been Birmingham at home or something. And I, I just said to Gaz, "Look, I, I feel that I'm ready." And he said he was going to put Robbo back in. And that it was unfair to to leave Eastie out after playing. Um, so I, I took it well. Said that's absolutely fine. I'll carry on training and and doing all I can do to change your mind. Mm-hmm. And the opportunity came up for for me to to go out on loan um, and play games. Um, and obviously, like I said, once you've once you've tasted playing first team football, that that's all you want to do. There's no point in putting in the hard work. Monday to Friday to sit on the bench or sit in the stands. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if I hadn't played, started playing at 19 and had that hunger for it, then I may have I may have just sat there and, and bided my time and, and waited. But I was young and hot headed and maybe had ideas of grandeur and and wanted to get out and play and, and prove that I could still do it. Um, mm. And, I think that's and it, understandable. Yeah, and like, and at the time, I think um, I'd been out of the team for a couple of weeks, and it was like I said in the December and in the January. Um, I think Celtic had put in an offer, um, but at the time, the club weren't prepared to to sell me for the valuation that that Celtic could put on me. Um, Do you know what that was? Do you were you aware of the the price that they'd offered? Yeah, recently I only found I found out about six months ago just chatting with someone over the summer. So I think they'd offered 3.5, um, and the Venkies had obviously got a list of everyone's names with with a valuation next to it, and I think they wanted six million for me. How they worked that out, I'm I'm not <laughs> quite sure. But um, but if they wanted six million for me, then I dread to think what they wanted for for some of the other lads. Um, so that that sort of got kiboshed, and I kind of just had to shut up and, and put up, and it it was it was frustrating. But I uh, say so yeah, was that Celtic are a, I obviously I'm a Blackburn fan and I love Rovers, but Celtic are a huge club. Was that something? Is that a regret? Would you say or a frustration that that never happened? Is that something that obviously you'd have you'd have loved to have been able to to go and do and play for such a huge club like Celtic? Yeah, look, it's it's frustrating, but it was it was out of my control. So it's 
it doesn't become a regret until I've got a decision to yeah. make. And so I'd, I'd say it's it's more straight in thing than than it is a regret not going there. Um, but like everyone's everyone's got regrets. So look back back on on life and football and in everyone. People would be lying if they said they haven't. Um, the season that I played in the Prem, I could have could have left that summer, um, but I chose not to. Um, Who was that? So if you don't mind my asking. Um, I think Stoke and Leicester were interested at the time, yeah. um, and I'm, I'm not saying I would have gone there and, and played, but obviously they they expressed an interest, and I said to my agent at the time that that I wasn't that I wasn't bothered whether it happened or not and not to pursue it because I'd been at Blackburn for years. I felt like I was going to get a chance to play the following season um, and and basically dismissed any interest because the club did, did mean a lot to me at the time. Like yeah. I wanted to stay in, stay in play. So I think if, if you go back and look at how things things turned out then I may have a few regrets but but at the time I felt like I was I was making the right decision mm-hmm. definitely um and obviously then you, you did end up so you did leave obviously you had a couple of law moves um it was Norwich wasn't it the permanent move that you made um what was that like obviously they'd just been promoted um I think had they just been promoted at that point? Yeah, to the yeah. Premier League? yeah. Yeah. So what was that like going in? Were you going in fighting for a place as number one, or, or did you go in being aware that maybe you would be a second choice? Yeah, I was like I was made fully aware at the time that um, that I'd be second choice. That that there was obviously two two good goalkeepers there at the time, and and Deck was highly thought of, and obviously John. Had, played for England and he'd been unbelievable that season and getting them promoted. I think he played every game. Um, mm. So I knew it was, it was tough walking into it. Um, but at the same time, it was, it was right to walk away from Blackburn um, because I knew I wasn't, I wasn't going to get a chance. The club were under embargo. I think it was one player in one player out and, Obviously, me and me and Gaz sat and had a chat. He told me his plans, and it was the right thing for me, and it was the right thing for the club. Um, mm. Because I, could, I had a year left. I could have stayed and, and waited it out and hoped for and wished for things to change. But there was no point in me sitting there being frustrated and ultimately the club not being able to bring someone in that they would be able to use so it was it was beneficial for both parties in the end yeah just something that you felt that was right at the time obviously you had a good a good seven years at the club and it was just time to move on and obviously the club felt the same way um yeah but yeah so i just want to move back now so we're going to go back a few years and i do want to talk about him um i have mentioned him a few times so pedersen said recently in a club q a that the less said about Steve Keane, the better. Um, as a player, and a player that was around at that time, what were your opinions on him? Was there a, was there a thought amongst the players that this man wasn't right for the job? Was he well-liked? Because obviously people have said that he, he may have been a very good first-team coach and well-regarded there, but that doesn't mean he's a good manager. Were the players happy with him as, as the gaffer or... Was it something that was clear wasn't working? Um, so the first thing and, and probably the most important thing for me to say is that in no way am I, am I related to him. <laughs> um, <laughs> barely tarred with that brush. Um, like there was there was a BBC journalist that. Uh, somehow made the link that I was and, and put it on their website. And I think we've gone and played Bristol City. And, you know, they do, like they've got everybody's picture and a little small caption underneath. Yeah. Their, uh, whoever creates their program, head of press, whatever it is, had, had put underneath um, Jake Keane, um, 
two appearances because I played in the cup and I played in the pram. Yeah. Two appearances for Blackburn, um, son of manager Steve Keane. <laughs> and like, obviously the lads were taking the piss in the dressing room, and it, like I lost my head a little bit. So went out, found our media guy, and said, "Right, get go and get the head of media down here now. Like I'm just gonna batter him." <laughs> and, um, so he'd gone and got him, and by that point I'd calmed down and just fucking what started winding him up. Then just said, mate, come on, it's just it's lazy journalism, like yeah, massively. At massively. least if you're gonna put something down, like do a bit of research. And uh, he apologised, and we had a laugh about it in the end. But yeah, in, in no way am I related to Uncle Sid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think with what Gant said, I can go back probably a year before that, um, when I was in the reserve team. Um, uh, Big Sam who was a gaffer at the time, had, um, I don't know if it's right to say he held auditions, but um, there was three coaches that, that came in one Thursday morning and um, each of them were tasked with putting on a session for, for the resi squad. Mm-hmm. And he wanted, he wanted feedback on, on who we thought put on a good session, um, what they were like as a person and, and all the rest of it. And it was sort of unanimous that that all the boys that that trained that morning said Steve's session was the best. Mm-hmm. Um, whether that played a role in him getting the the first team coach's job, I, I don't know. But um, we were asked for our opinions at the time, and and we did say he was he was the best out of the three. Um, and as a coach, he was brilliant. His sessions were fun, lively, like they were they were to the point. Um like they, they were good sessions and you can't you can't take that away from him. And I think you're right in saying that sometimes you can make a great coach but not a manager. Mm-hmm. And I think because he'd been there a season already as a first team coach, he was more he was more of the lads' mates. He was the go-between between the lads and the gaffer. Um, so if you had a problem, you'd go and you'd have a chat with him, and then he'd go and relay that message. And he was, like I said, he he was the go-between, um, and he was good at that. And but I think by being being that go-between, he was almost too friendly with the lads. He sort of became one of one of us like with the jokes and having a laugh and and having like beers with us when we went out and all the rest of it and to make that transition into being the manager where you've got to make ruthless decisions you've got to you've got to come down hard on the lads when they're not performing or when a session isn't isn't going to plan I think you found that difficult um so I think if he'd have, if he'd have left Blackburn and gone on to be a manager elsewhere, he'd have done he, he, he might have done better. But I think it's it's difficult when you've gone from being a first team coach at the club and being as well liked to then being the man in charge making making the tough decisions and and obviously there's there's the way in which he became the manager. Yeah. Um, leaves a lot to be desired with obviously that video and and you don't know what goes on behind the scenes and who says what to who and and all the rest of it so I think there was there was a bit of skepticism amongst the lads when when the gaffer did get sacked because we were doing well we were seventh yeah. seventh in the league and it didn't make any sense to us so I yeah. think I think there was all the everyone was a bit skeptical about it and I don't there was a lack of trust there I think was that between between player and manager you mean or just in general because of how Sam had lost his job yeah I think just it was because of how Sam had lost his job and I don't think anybody will, will know the real reasons why um but yeah it was it was sort of a weird one him going from coach to manager and then the way in which Sam did lose his job I think there was a bit of scepticism and the fact that we didn't do 
we didn't do anywhere near enough no. as well as what we should have done when when Big Sam did leave. It, I think it's one of them for for fans. It's a, a period of the time of the club that just it, it's it's masked with confusion. Um, Sam leaving is understandable if you bring in a manager that's going to play attractive football and also get results. Um, mm. But the fact of the matter is, we probably didn't have the players at our disposable that our disposal that could do that. Um, so it was a, a very strange, and of course, there's the big thing with Jerome Anderson and his son Miles. And did you ever meet Miles? Was he someone that you were that you ever friendly with at all? Or yeah, he was he was part of the uh, reserve team. So we all we all got changed together. We trained together. We all went out to eat and like out on over weekend together. So he was he was part of it. And then I, f- I felt sorry. A little bit for Miles because his dad was sort of tainted with with bringing yeah. in all these players and and the demise of the club. Um, like Miles, he's a lovely lad and he's at Hartlepool now and I've seen him twice this season. Mm. Um, and still chat to him. He's 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 a, he's a good lad. Um, and I don't think any animosity or or ill will can be be aimed at him. Yeah, he's he's a lad that is sort of tainted by his dad, and and I've never met his dad, and but I think at the time it was just even the players didn't know what was going on. There was yeah. new faces coming in, and it was like, well, where's he come from? And we'd sign one player, and then it then the next day his mate would turn up, or his mate would be training with us because he'd come over from Portugal and it was like, well, if you're going to sign me, you've got to sign yeah. my friend. So someone's there to live with me. And yeah, yeah it, was, it was a weird one. There was such a huge influx, at, especially in that first season in the championship of just Portuguese players that no one had heard of. Mm. Um, it was a, it was an interesting time. And, and it's just interesting hearing from that player's perspective, because I think you're the first one we've spoke to who was there around that time and where there was a, a mass amount of change. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's one of them, isn't it? With, with agents, agents are always going to play a huge part. And I think for Rovers fans, I think that's the one big thing that they can't get over with the Venkies right now. Um, is just the yeah. demise that's, that's gone on since. I, I um, think they took over the club, not fully understanding football. Um, I think, yeah. The ins and outs of it. I, th- I think I heard, a rumour that they didn't think you could get relegated. Yeah, I've heard that. I think it might have been Keith Andrews or Jason Law or someone like that who gave an interview um, saying that they were that he didn't think they were aware. And is that something that was that went around with the lads as well? Is that something yeah. that you were aware of? Yeah, um, I think it, it almost got to a point where we were that much of a laughing stock that even the lads thought, fucking hell, like... Yeah. You don't laugh, you'll cry. We had this one bloke called Chevy Singh that turned up one oh, day. Oh, Chevy Singh, yeah. We know old Chevy. Con- yeah, old concrete tash. Um, <laughs> he, he was playing football manager. He was honestly playing football manager. Um, there was one transfer window. Um, I think the club had a, a spare million pounds, as you do. Um, and they wanted to sign a young English-British transfer to to make a statement I don't know and I remember speaking to to one of the analysis blokes and at the time their mandate was we've got a million pounds find who's the best young talent we can get for it so they they spent the last 48 hours of that transfer window ringing around different clubs um offering a million pounds for like reserve team players that they were going to take a chance on. And obviously they phoned Sheffield United and paid a million pounds for um, Jordan Slew. Was it Jordan Slew? Was that him? Wow. Yeah. He did lots. <laughs> um, was that a Shebby signing, the Jordan Slew one, or was that was that just a, a gamble from the, the club? I think that was a gamble from the club. But like I said, I think it was... Was we've got a million pounds floating around in the budget. Let's go and buy someone young and, and see if see who we can get and hopefully we can it works out and we sell them for 
20 million. Yeah, didn't do with Jordan Slew. I think he, he scored a penalty against us in our season in League One again in the, um, what's it called? The, the Football League Cup, whatever it's called, the EFL Trophy. Oh, yeah. Um, and he celebrated right in front of the Rovers fans, and we didn't really care that much. It was an interesting one, that. Um, but just that entire time, it's interesting. When you say you were playing football manager, do you mean he was using football manager to find players? or? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he was playing real life football manager. <laughs> and I think that just, I think if people go, I don't understand how Blackburn have ended up in this situation. I think if you go, if you work back to that point, you'll, and then look at the events that, that followed, you'd go, ah, yeah, that's that's how that happened. Yeah, it was interesting. Shebby's another one that came in and just, Confuse everyone obviously called MGP and OAP, um, yeah, and all that sort of stuff, which obviously is just going to have a, a huge negative impact because Pedersen's someone that is Rovers fans. I know for me anyway, when I was growing up, he was the he was my player, my favourite. Um, yeah. So I think to have that sense of all of a sudden just yeah disrespect. It, yeah, and it didn't sit well with the lads either. Was Shebby someone that that ruffled a lot of feathers? Then was it someone that the lads were aware? You can't trust this guy as far as you can throw him. Yeah, you couldn't trust him. And it was one of them. Like, you you, you were, you were, didn't want to say anything in front of him because you knew it would get relayed to the owners. And if he didn't like what he heard, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't be involved. And I think I made the penny drop with the owners. But one day he was there and then one day he wasn't. Just left. Yeah, I think the owner's a big thing with that, with Anderson and, and Singh, just with everything, I think, like you say, they trusted the wrong people. And yeah, hopefully my... now, I think that, I might get some stick for saying this, but they seem to be coming out on the other side, where now they're letting football people run the club, so it's good to see. Um, so, finally, um, a quick word on Rovers now. Obviously, you still look out for the results, and there's not much football going on. Um, but do you think... With the current, you know, setup that we've got with with more brain and and we seem to be coming out the other side, do you think there's a way back to the Premier League, or would you say that's something that, you know, let's just slow down a little bit and not get ahead of ourselves? I think with any club, I think it's best to to take things as they come rather than than dump a load of expectations on them. I think if the lads are doing well, support them and and let them carry on. Don't don't build them up too much, and the same applies if if they do go for a bad run of results. Don't don't get on at them because it's it's not going to help. The lads aren't going out and losing games on purpose. Um, yeah. But I think like Mowbray's gone in and he, he obviously got promoted to back to the championship and and the lads are doing well. Um, like I still still know a couple of them that are there and and speak to them, and it seems like it's it's an enjoyable place to be again. Um, I think it's it's evident that, that the manager cares about the lads and, and cares about the club. And I think slowly the the feel good factors coming back to the club and, and maybe it did take for things to go drastically wrong to for that to happen. But for me I think with the squad that they've got, they've got a chance. Um and I'd be surprised I'd be surprised if if they didn't if football does restart that they didn't finish in the playoffs, um, and then again with if they can keep hold of the right players and, and maybe add one or two for the following season, I think they've got they've got every chance. Mhm, hundred percent. I think I'd go with you there. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, but let's also acknowledge that things are starting to look a little bit better. And yeah. maybe it won't be long before we can be celebrating something. Um, anyway, Jake, it's been fantastic speaking to you. Um, I really, really appreciate you coming on. Um, and obviously being so open as well, I think it's good when you've got players that can come on and just speak their mind. Because I think for us anyway, as fans, hearing about times that, as much as it annoys us, hearing about those times is interesting because it is a bit of a, there's a bit of a dark cloud, isn't there? Not many people know what's going on or what went on, should I say? Um, no, exactly. And I think, I think that's like, it's, 
me speaking my mind has, has probably got me into trouble more times than, than I care to admit. Um, but I think the best policy is is to be honest where you can and, you, and give the fans a bit of a better insight rather than scaremongering and rumours flying about and because it it doesn't it doesn't do any any good for the players that that are at the club or were at the club because like you said there's people make up their own minds and have their own perceptions of of what got what's gone on and I think if you can set a few people straight with the truth then it's up to them to whether they believe it or not but I think if a player has said it that spent a lot of time there and has got nothing to lose by by telling you the truth then hopefully it clears a few things up for the for people no 100 percent, and obviously we appreciate it as fans and i appreciate obviously taking the time out of your day looking after your little lad to to come on and um just talk some football and and waste an hour of what is going to be a boring saturday afternoon um but yeah thanks again jake i um, really appreciate it um and yeah i hope that everything goes well with the end of the season at Notts county um and that you carry on having all the success there cheers mate no i appreciate it